I mean, it was just a normal day, and we were going to do our thing on the way to a prayer meeting in the temple. Yeah, it, it was just a normal day. We were going to the temple. We were we were going to pray together, and uh, that's when it all started to happen. He was sitting right there. He was yelling at us. Wanted some money. Wasn't mad or anything. Just needed some money. He was lame, a beggar. That's how he survived. I didn't know what was about to happen. I just started talking to the guy, and all I know was I didn't have any money to give him, and I was just going to help him out. I mean. Who would think, hey, I'm gonna help this guy out and then I'm gonna get arrested. But that's what happened. Yeah, that's what happened. Look, I get it. The religious leaders hate us. Well, maybe I should say they hate Jesus a lot. Oh, no, John is 100% correct. They absolutely hate us. They've been looking for a way to get us for months. It, it, it's like anything we do, they're watching us. It, I, it's been so long since I've seen those two creeps they took us in front of. It's, it's all, all the way back to, you know, it's fine. It's, it's, it's all the way back to when I stood in the courtyard and, and I watched what they did. Yeah, it's kind of hard for my man Peter to talk about that particular night because it's like his worst night ever. He really blew it in the courtyard. We all know that. I mean, he's like Christ's best friend and he denied him five times. Was it six? It was a lot. Yeah, John said five or six times, right? That's his running joke. Look, it was only three. Those were the same men that were, were lying their socks off about Jesus. And here we are standing in front of him because we helped a lame man. God made him walk again. It's Jesus' power. Yeah, they treated us a little differently than Jesus. They ran his mock trial in the middle of the night, which is against our law. But with us, they put us in jail for the night. I don't know all the reasons why they felt like they had to do it that way. Maybe they're trying to break us, make us a little more pliable with their line of questioning. It's probably it. So we're standing in front of him, and these guys start to question us. Like, by what power or what name did you do this? <laughs> it's like it's like they didn't know. But we had to respond. And honestly, I, I felt something like this power that, that I haven't felt since Pentecost. I just started talking. Yeah, I gotta hand it to Peter. I mean, normally, as you can probably tell, I don't like to say a lot of nice things about him. But my man was on fire that day. I just said it like it was. I. I told them that the Jesus they crucified and that God had raised from the dead was the one who healed this man. He also showed them from our own scriptures who Jesus really was. He pointed out that the scriptures have always pointed to Jesus, that he's our cornerstone. Then things got a little bit controversial. I had heard Jesus say before that he was the only way to God. That's not his most popular teaching, but I basically said the same thing in front of everybody. I said that salvation is found in no other name but Jesus. They didn't like that. No, they didn't like that. They kind of had to regroup after that. Then they came back at us and they said, yeah man, you could have heard a pin drop. So the next thing they did is come back to us and said, We just wanted to see if you would come back next week is what uh, that is to be continued. Um, so the, the story that we look at today is basically what you just heard. It's, uh, it's amazing when you try to do some good to help someone, um, all the implications that can come from it. You may have, from the goodness of your heart, tried to do something kind for someone and it may have backfired on you. And that's a rough feeling, and that's exactly what Peter and John are feeling. How did this happen? Um, we healed this man by the power of God. Peter preaches a sermon, and then now they're before the authorities. As we look at this passage today, we're going to look at verses 1 through 12 of Acts chapter 4, and we're talking about responding to opposition. Uh, we, we did see at the end of chapter 2 that it said that they enjoyed the favor of all the people. 
Those days are over now. They're not really enjoying the favor of all the people. They are before their accusers in a, in a court of law. Or though it be religious, it's still very binding on its implications. And it, it basically, this begins three centuries in the early church of persecution. And there were different, there was some historians tell us there was 10 different waves of persecution. And we, we understand what it is to be opposed in cert, to a certain level today. Uh, it's not obviously the same, um, but it, it's certainly their lives were in very much danger. And you, you may have been laughed at and um, others may have sort of turned their back on you when you came to be a follower of Christ. And it does put the same question in our heart. How do we respond when people begin to oppose us merely for living out what we believe, for holding fast and holding tightly to God's unerring truth? How do we respond to opposition? Because when we're being opposed, the best doesn't just naturally flow out of us. We're going to see some help today from God's Word. And I first of all want to read verses 1 and 2 of Acts chapter 4 where it says this. And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So you see this cast of characters in verse 1. And basically the sense you get, last week we looked all the way through verse 26 of chapter 3, is that there was an interruption to the sermon. Peter was preaching, and all of a sudden, these groups come and apprehend him. So the priest, of course, the religious leaders of the temple, and then the captain of the temple, that would be the religious police. There was basically security. And then it says, and the Sadducees came upon them. Now we certainly saw the Sadducees during the Gospels, during the ministry of Christ. The more, this is interesting, the more popular group that would come after Christ were the sort of the antithesis yet um, companions of the Sadducees, the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were the religious conservatives and the Sadducees were the religious liberals. And what's interesting is that the, the religious conservatives couldn't stand Jesus because he was not traditional enough for them. He was not crossing his T's and dotting his I's in their interpretation of the law. They had all this additional stuff to the law of God, and that really bothered the Pharisees. But the Sadducees, they were more in line with Rome. They were basically currying favor politically as much as they could. But they were religious liberals in that they did not believe in the supernatural. They didn't believe in angels and demons and afterlife. And the big thing they were against was the resurrection of the body. They didn't believe that there was such a thing. And the reason that you'll find the Sadducees more in the book of Acts and the Pharisees more in the gospel is because the book of Acts is filled with a group of people that are proclaiming that Jesus has risen from the dead. And that got under the skin of the Sadducees. And they became sort of, they kind of ran points on opposition and persecution of the church. Now, notice the word in verse 2. It says, the Sadducees came upon them, and it says, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So what does the resurrection do to people? Apparently, it greatly annoys them. That word annoys means just what you think it means. It means to be sort of exasperated and and deeply bothered and troubled by something. Um, This uh, the the latter part of this week, Mrs. Lee and I went to the Dallas area to check on our one-year-old grandson, and he's a very mild, smiley kid. And uh, but I did find that there is an exception. Uh, We were staying in the room, kind of across the hall from him. By the way, we did find out that Jack, his name is Jack, that Jack's going to be having a baby sister in September, yes. I don't know how that made it into the sermon. It wasn't in the notes, but it, <laughs> maybe the Spirit of God is upon me. I don't know. Anyway, I'm trying to preach, y'all. Anyway, so the, we were there for th- three nights, and uh, in the morning, this mild, sweet, smiley, happy guy would let out a scream when his mother went to get him. And it was like they had let the wild dogs in the room and he's fighting for his life kind of scream. 
And I'm kind of curious as to what it is. And then they showed me there's this, have you seen the sort of the nasal suckers that moms have these days? (laughs) That's what he's not into. And according to verse 2, he was greatly annoyed. (laughs) I don't blame him. I wouldn't like Mrs. Lee to say, good morning, sweet boy. (laughs) You know. Oh. But let me give you the takeaway from verses 1 and 2. Point number 1 on your outline this morning. Know that Christ annoys the world when accurately presented. When we accurately present Christ to the world, the resurrected Lord, it greatly annoys them. Do you ever get a little bothered when people that don't acknowledge the authority of Scripture really love Jesus? When Jesus becomes the hero of every group, of every body, we should be a little on edge. I think what it means is we or someone has not accurately presented Jesus to everyone. Our youth pastor at the downtown campus, Garrett, was we were talking actually about this particular issue, and he was telling me that he likes to read to his little two-year-old daughter at night, and a lot of times he will make up stories. He's reading a book, he's turning the pages, and he's making up crazy stories that aren't in the book, and she loves it. He'll turn the page, and then as soon as he finishes, she'll say, do it again, Daddy, do it again. And then he'll make up another story in the book and just turn the page just to be a fun dad. Now, sometimes the little May, May is her name, and, and she will bring that same book to her mom. Her mom doesn't roll like that. <laughs> What's her mom do? Her mom reads the boring story in the book. <laughs> a boring Winnie the Pooh story or whatever it is, and May protests. It's like, ah, you know, <laughs> that's not how I like the story. And we were talking, and he said, you know, I think that's how some people, they read the Bible that way. You read the Bible, and you want it to say whatever, you find in there whatever you want to find in there. And you want it to say what you hope it says. And there you find a Jesus that agrees with everything that you like. And in it, you will find a sort of a pro-choice, pro-LGBTQ Pro everything a positive, good, a source of all good type of Jesus that the world is crazy about, but that's just not who Jesus is. If you present Jesus as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the exalted one that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, the, the upholder of divine truth, the one who gave authority to the Old Testament and to his very words. You, you don't find the updated 2023 refashioned Jesus version that people like. What do we do? <laughs> what do we do? I mean, what do we do? Do we just sort of give them that Jesus because he is more liked? Or do we share and teach him as the Bible does? Well, we, we should. Now, I, I'm not saying, brothers and sisters, that we should try to add some extra fire, fuel to the fire. We shouldn't just, wow, people are annoyed at Jesus, great, let's keep annoying those rascals. And then we can put our own hatred, our own vitriol, our own annoying personality into it and blame it on Jesus. No, that's you. (laughs) But if we rightly tell people who Jesus actually is, like the early church did, it annoyed the Pharisees and it will annoy people in our day. And we should not be deterred by the annoyance of the world. Now... In verses 3 through 6, we see another powerful aspect of this story. It says this, And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Now, all of a sudden, they're going by the book. You remember a few months earlier when Jesus was uh, apprehended at night, and against the custom of their law, they went ahead and ran the sorry little trial at night. Mama was right when she says nothing good happens after midnight, right? But they go ahead and they just throw these guys in jail. Maybe it was, it was likely a power play, try to sort of get them to think about what happened to their leader a few months earlier and maybe make them a little more open to their questioning. In verse 4 it says, Many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Now they did number differently in the first century. They, they count when you, would, when you look at the 
counting of the 5,000. It says the 5,000 men or then 4,000 men. Basically, the, the census was taken in a religious sense. And the way that you started a synagogue was when you had 10 men in a town or a village or a neighborhood, you could start a synagogue. And so I think the, the concept of 5,000 men meant this is such a huge number to the Jewish people, it could start this many synagogues. It was another way of saying a massive amount of people. And then in verse 5 it says, On the next day their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all those who were of the high priestly family. Now why mention by name some of these guys, especially Annas and Caiaphas? It's because, as I mentioned a few months earlier, Peter was outside the courtyard in the middle of the night, kind of listening in to a trial that both Annas and Caiaphas were involved with. And it came that particular night, they indicted Jesus. I think they got these men specifically to be there to say, hey, why don't you come just to be the sinister, eerie presence and sort of remind them if they don't listen to us, they should be thinking about what happened to their leader, to their founder. We, we found him guilty and he died the most cruel death. So they're trying to intimidate, they're trying to manipulate, they're trying to stack the deck against them. But I, I think that the words of hope in verse 4 and verse 5 are meant to give us an extra sense of encouragement. Verse 4 reminds us that many of those who heard it already believed. People were believing. And, and yeah, in and, and 3 and 4, and so in, in 4 then it says, and it came to 5,000 people. A bunch of people were believing. You know what this reminds us of? This reminds us that you're going to have to do a lot more than bring persecution or opposition to stop the movement of God. You have to do more than lock somebody up to stop the spreading of the word of God. And the second principle this morning is this. Remember that opposition often results in great spiritual blessing. I think many of you have tasted that in your own life. Someone opposed you, maybe for your faith, maybe on a moral ground, and hopefully you have the demeanor of Christ. What this says when people persecute you and say all kinds of things falsely against you, rejoice and be glad for greater is your reward in heaven. Don't find your joy in what people think of you and what people say of you. Find your joy of who you are in Christ and treasure your ultimate value of heaven. And place your hope there. Don't live for the applause of this world, but live in light of the other. Maybe you've tasted that before. And opposition worked great spiritual benefit in your life. Well, the opposition in the early church only served to spread the gospel. One of the Roman emperors that came hard after Christianity was a man named Diocletian. Not a very popular person in history. Not something that's on the tip of our tongue. But he was so excited about his persecution of the early church that he once made a, a badge or a banner that said that he is the one that stamped out Christianity. And I don't think anybody talks much about Diocletian, but everywhere you look, there is a cross in our country. Everywhere you look, there is a house of worship with people coming to worship the one true Christ. Now, if you're in the early church, you could, start a, you could sort of begin to sweat a little bit because you're feeling the heat of all the opposition. And you could huddle up with your fellow believers and say, this is bad, guys. They're coming after us. Or you could look at what God was doing and say, yeah, it's bad, but is it just me? Or are thousands of people believing, even though they're being opposed? And I think sometimes we as Christians, we sort of focus too much on all the problems in the world and the problems in the church. And I'm not saying that they're not significant problems. I'm not even implying that we shouldn't address the problems but should we focus on them to the point that we lose sight of what God's doing absolutely not yeah I, I'm concerned about encroaching liberalism in the world it sneaks its way into the church and I'm concerned about how the sexual revolution seems to be making progress on all fronts but I mean, but look around you this morning that <laughs> there's something to be thankful for that there are people that still believe uh, I, I remember I've had the privilege of going to China a few times. And if you read the history of that country, the modern history even, 
In 1900, the Boxer Rebellion, I mean, they're basically doing what is generally unthinkable now. They're literally killing Western missionaries trying to get that awful uh, Western religion out of their country. And then Mao Zedong in the 50s had the Cultural Revolution, which was a slaughter of anything that was Western and, and largely a religious persecution where millions died for their faith. But if you go there now, they're, that's probably the, the largest amount of Christians anywhere in the world, albeit they meet underground. And I've, I've had the privilege of softly singing hymns in an in a underground church in China where someone came up to me and said, you're a pastor, right? And I said, yes. You, you've come here tonight to speak to us. I said, yes. Um, there could be some spies in the room, so don't tell anybody that you came here to China to talk to us about Jesus. But, but when you begin to speak, tell them why it's important to believe in God. That's not exactly what the usher said to me this morning. <laughs> That's not exactly how the sound booth put my mic on this morning. He said, by the way, be careful because there's some spies in the room. What's happening, though, what's happening is that about 100 million people have given their lives to Christ and are gladly meeting underground, even amidst current massive opposition. So yeah, I mean, it's discouraging to see things going poorly on certain fronts. But hold your head high, brothers and sisters. Remember verse 4. Remember God's at work. God is at work in your life when you experience trial and opposition. And he's at work in the church as well. And in verse 7, the line of questioning gets me here. And when they had set them in the midst, in the midst they inquired... By what power or what name did you do this? Well, first of all, they, this is the intellectual elite and the, the power people talking to two guys from Galilee that they probably thought were country bumpkins. And this is their town. This is their turf. This is their world. And that question, by what power or what name did you do this? Don't you think? Remember why they're there. Remember why they're there. They're there because they healed somebody who was walking and leaping and praising God everywhere. And then they start preaching the message about the one that actually healed them. So rather than bring in the lame man and say, uh, this is amazing. We've seen this unsavory character for the last 40 years at that same spot. And he's walking around. Could you guys give us some more information on what happened here? They didn't care about the lame man. They didn't care about something good that was happening. You know what their big question is? Where's your permit? <laughs> um, do you have the right to do this? Who authorized you? Now, they knew the answer to the question. But they just wanted to remind them. We know that you don't have the right to do this. You know why? Because if anybody does anything, it's because we authorize them. By the way, I, I want to encourage you to look at what's going on here and sort of apply it to, to a sort of a sneaky, subtle habit we have in our personal relationships. Sometimes we try to get what we want from someone by using intimidation and manipulation. And Maybe it's not a physical intimidation, but it's a verbal intimidation. And we sort of hold it over people's heads, where it, whether it could be a spouse or, you know, I understand that threatening can get you only so far with a, a kid. And sometimes within parenting, it feels like you're making progress because you've, you've sort of bowed up to a rebellious child and you're coming at them. But intimidation won't repair the relationship and won't have lasting good from it. And I think sometimes rather than use plain, clear communication, we stuff something in a sarcastic question and are hoping we made our point. But rather than hide what you really are saying through a question or through some intimidating thing, literally just say what you mean and have the courage to gently and calmly phrase what your heart is saying rather than try to sort of put someone in a corner and get what you want out of them. I just noticed that's 
sort of a Sadducee tendency that we don't naturally shed as believers. Anyway, that's just a bonus point for coming. But what's the real point? That's in verse 8. That's this. It simply says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. Now, the blank on number 3 this morning is this. Aim for a continual filling of the Holy Spirit. And we've already seen before that Peter was filled with the Spirit. Why do we see it again? Why will we see it in other parts of the book of Acts. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, if you were here when we talked about the Sunday of Pentecost and the early part of Acts chapter 2, we noticed a distinction between baptism and fullness. And sort of a, a quote I had from John Stott in his, in his book called Baptism and Fullness is that believers experience one baptism and many fillings. Baptism of the Spirit is synonymous with conversion. When we come to know Christ, He enters our heart and He immerses us with new power, with new life. But as we journey in our faith, we need to be filled over and over again. Filled is a word in this sense that means to be controlled or governed by it. When you fill your cup with coffee, your cup is now sort of governed, in, in a sense, by what is in the container. And we first note that Peter's life is now filled by God. God, through the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, has come upon him. And so this is a repeatable experience. There are moments when we are filled with the flesh, with our sinful nature. We, it doesn't mean that the Spirit has left us. Matter of fact, we read in Ephesians 4.30, it says, Don't grieve the Spirit whom you were sealed with from the day of redemption. So the Spirit of God in our life is eternal. When you come to know Christ, the Spirit seals you, and He will lead you to the end of your life and will ultimately redeem you. What He authorizes what he authors he finishes what he begins he takes to the very end so it doesn't mean that the spirit left Peter and came back because we're sealed with the spirit but it does mean that there was a fresh sense of power on Peter's life likely the text doesn't say it but likely because he was in a position where he had nowhere else to go you can just imagine how intimidated this must have been to be in jail all night, to be doing something good and to be treated as if you did something bad. He needed God more than he ever needed him before. And the result was God came upon him and gave him strength. Brothers, you and I need to sh get rid of all self-reliance and self-dependence upon what we can bring to the table. And as we do that, as we say no to ourselves and yes to him, what happens well, we become filled with the Spirit. I don't think we always know when we're filled with the Spirit. I don't think, wait a minute, am I filled with the Spirit right now? I don't know. It's not so much a measurable thing that there's a real clear sense, oh, now you are, now you are. It's not. doesn't really work that way. But I think you can sense it in those moments where you have sin in front of you and you all of a sudden prefer righteousness to sin. Or maybe those moments, have you ever had that really difficult conversation that you need to have? Maybe it's a, an apology you need to make to your spouse, but your pride has kept you from doing it. Maybe it's dealing with an issue with one of your family members that you've just sort of put off because it's kind of hard to talk about. Maybe it's a, it's a neighbor that you've been praying for, waving at, smiling at, talking about the dogs, talking about the, the newspaper and the events of the day. But the Lord has laid, you, laid them on your heart over and over again, and you just don't know what to say. Those are those moments and seasons in life that you can be filled with the Spirit, governed by the Spirit of God. And right when you need it, God gives you what you need to say. You remember when Jesus said, it's in the Olivet Discourse in several different parts of the Gospels, but places like Mark chapter 13, verse 11, Jesus told the disciples, you're going to be before rulers and leaders and don't worry about what to say. At that time, the Holy Spirit will give you utterance. Well, this is that moment. This is the moment. They're standing before leaders. And what happened? 
Well, I'll tell you what happened. God did what he said he would do. Peter was dependent upon Christ. He looked to the Lord, and all of a sudden God filled him. So I think we should not be hesitant to say, Lord, fill me with your spirit today. I don't want to be governed by my flesh. I don't want to be governed by my own desires. I want your spirit to dominate me. That's the kind of day I'm having. That's the kind of life I'm having. Notice he says in verse 8, he calls them rulers of the people and elders. By the way, I think one of the ways that you know if you're filled with the Spirit is if you treat people with dignity and respect. I think we're so used to seeing people get uppity and upset about everything. We start clapping and saying, yeah, that guy's full of the Spirit because he was rude as he possibly could be. I, I don't think that goes with being full of the Spirit. He spoke to them and gave them their titles. If he were on Twitter, he probably would have said, you know what? You guys are sons of motherless goats and may the flies of a thousand buffaloes infest your armpits forever. <laughs> That's what he would have said on Twitter. And we would have said, yeah, Peter, get them. Well, he treats them with dignity and says, rulers of the people and of the elders. In verse 9, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means, by what means this man has been healed... I, that's a pretty fair question, and I'm assuming that his tone was God-honoring. He just wanted to say, um, is this a new thing that we're doing here? Are we putting people on trial for doing good? By the way, have you ever been to the place in your life where your eyes are so close to the hand of God and your heart is so hard that all you see in everything and everyone is evil. You, you're, Spurgeon talked about, Lord, open our eyes wider to the bounty of thy goodness. I think sometimes, I mean, these Sadducees are exhibit A, and people whose heart were so hard, they couldn't say, man, Peter, I'm not down with that sermon, but I got to hand it to you. Healing that lame guy, that was good stuff. Instead, jail and a trial and he's just kind of saying it like it is like first of all we're on trial for this in verse 10 let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead by this man by him this man is standing before you well now that's boldness that's the kind of stuff that Peter didn't have a few months ago when he denied Christ three times. But now he has it. And he basically said, you thought so little of Christ that you crucified him, but God the Father thought so much of his son that he raised him from the dead. And by the way, he used the very terms that he knew the Sadducees hated. This would have been a great moment for Peter to avoid the resurrection if he was trying to play it safe, but he doesn't. And then in verse 11, he has to go quoting psalms on them. And he says, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. All the general contractors in the room were going, say, what? All the biblical scholars are going, you can't use Psalm 118 for this guy. So... The concept of the cornerstone was a more prominent aspect of ancient building. And you, the image is you had a, a rock pile, sort of a quarry somewhere, and you'd go and you'd find all the rocks. You'd put the good ones over here, the ones you were going to use, and the bad ones you would sort of keep there or maybe put in another pile. And imagine that you're ready to start the building, and you're like, wait a second, we have to have the cornerstone that would join the walls. It was the, the base that everything else would be built upon. It was a load-bearing stone that was good enough, strong enough to keep everything together. And the image is, you go back to that rock pile and say, I don't think we have our cornerstone. Then you go to the pile of discarded rocks and say, wait a minute, there it is. And Jesus used this same passage himself to say, I'm the, the one in the discarded pile, but you're going to find that I'm the only one. I'm, I'm the cornerstone. I'm the only one that can hold your life together because I'm the only one that will die for your sins. And so this morning, I want to encourage you, number four on your outline this morning about responding to opposition, is this lean on Christ as your cornerstone. I like Colossians 1.17, 
that says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Now, I have this memory of when I was, um, the first time I ever saw or used a dolly, the load-bearing uh, little tools that's used to lift heavy boxes and other things, was when I was working uh, as a high schooler at uh, Jesus Chicken Shack known as Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and I was asked to go up and uh, get some of the boxes. The truck had a delivery. A couple of us young, uh, at least strong in our own minds, young people went up and I started carrying the boxes and I see the guy bringing out this thing. I didn't know what it was. He goes, put it right here. And it was a heavy box of chicken. I put it on there and then all of a sudden you pop it back and it's just, I'm like, this is amazing. Who thought of this? <laughs> I, wanna, I want you to picture in your life all the stuff that you're sort of getting off the truck and you're carrying around. And Jesus, the cornerstone, the dolly, if you will, the load-bearing one that can... And this dolly, have you ever used a dolly for something that was crazy heavy? A little bitty thing that carried a humongous desk or a humongous uh, type of thing that was so heavy, breaking your back. But you put it on there and it's light as a feather. That's why Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But you and I would rather just carry around hefty boxes of anxiety. Maybe you're carrying around the desire. Maybe like the example that Jamie, who was baptized this morning, she was carrying around the burden of her own guilt, and she came to know Christ. And as, Jamie, as Pastor Shannon said, she's now full of the joy of the Lord. Maybe you've been trying to save yourself for all these years. And Jesus is saying, hey, I'm your cornerstone. I'm that load-bearing rock that you can put everything on. I can handle and will forgive all of your sin. I can carry all of your burden. Some of you are carrying around burdens that were, you were never meant to carry. They belong to Christ because he can do something about them. He's, his wisdom, his sovereignty, and his amazing love wants you to be free from those burdens and take them and put them on the, the dolly of the Almighty and he will carry them. Trust Christ as your load-bearing cornerstone. In verse 12, Peter had to go there, didn't he? John may be going, would you be quiet now? <laughs> do you really have to do this? In verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else. Now, Jesus has only been around in terms of publicly about three years, a little over three years at this point. Peter's known him that long, and he was raised in a system that said God can't ever have skin on. God can't ever have form. God would never be anything other than mono. He would never be triune, never be three in one. And now Peter's been so convinced because of his resurrection and his life, he says there's salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I've shared before that. Maybe a decade ago now, Warren Buffett, or it was 2006 is when it was, is um, he gave about 85% of his $44 billion fortune at the time away. I think most of us could part with 85% of our $44 billion, couldn't we? And it was just an amazing news story, and he gave it to all kinds of charities, and he, uh, and he was interviewed and said, hey, what do you think about this? And he said, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to heaven, but this is surely a good way. And I think he may not, I think he may have meant that probably as a lighthearted statement rather than the theological one that preachers will pick up on. <laughs> but think about though for a minute, there's a whole lot of ways to heaven. This is certainly a good way. I think he believes pretty much what most of the world believes. There's probably an afterlife. And if you do, if you do more good than bad, you'll, you'll get there in time. But you think Peter agrees with Warren Buffett's statement about there are many ways to heaven. Religious tolerance has been part of uh, the founding of our country. And I would say in terms of raising a group of people to live together, religious tolerance was certainly the way to go. The, the, the original thinking was you're, there's not a state religion, and you're allowed to believe whatever you want to believe and say whatever you want to say, as long as your words don't threaten the life of another. And I like religious liberty. I think it's a wise way to live as a diverse group of people. Now, it's one thing to say, I have the right to say whatever I want, but you may have noticed about half a generation ago or so, the statement moved from, I can say whatever I want to, everything I say is right. 
and there was a subtle shift that tried to convince us that all truth claims had equal validity. Not just equal protection, but equal validity. And then you get yourself the redonkulous reasoning that says this. Well, well, your Christianity stuff, that's right for you, but it's not right for me. My this is right for me, but it may not be right for you. Everything has the exact same truth validity. Well, what that makes truth is, is to be this very weak, subjective, situational type of thing rather than something that is firm and fixed. It makes people feel better. Well, I think that kind of thinking has now been replaced by, oh, you're allowed to think and believe whatever you want as long as it is approved by the mob. And I would say verse 12, brothers and sisters, is not approved by the thinkers of the day. What do we do? We will be called narrow. We will be called arrogant. Where did Peter get this idea that salvation is found nowhere else? I'm thinking maybe Jesus. I'm thinking he maybe was actually listening in John 14, 6, when he huddled up his disciples before the Lord's Supper and said, I am the way and the truth. And the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Peter remembered that. And as he's preaching, he just goes ahead and says the same thing. Paul said the same thing in 1 Timothy 2.5. And why is there such an insistence on the exclusivity of Christ? Well, I I would say when you're called arrogant and narrow-minded, I would say that you have the opportunity to say, look, this is not something that I'm coming up with. This is not something that I'm saying because I believe I'm better than you, I'm smarter than you, or my God could beat your God up any day of the week. It is not about that. It's simply that I am not allowed an editing pen to the Word of God. It's something that my founders... Remember that person that asked you to go do something when you were an adolescent and you didn't really want to go? You talked to your parents about it and they said, well, we don't want you to go anyway. And so you go to your friend and say, you know, I'm sorry, my parents will let me go. And you're like, dodge that one. If someone jumps all over you because you believe Christ is the only way to God, point them to the book. This is not something I came up with. And why then, they would say, would Jesus ever say that? Well, I think he realized that the biggest problem in mankind is sin. The only way to deal with sin is for it to be covered and paid for and remissed. And the only one that was qualified to cover and pay for sin so that we could come to know God is the sinless one, is the perfect one, is the one who conquered sin by not just dying and burying our sin, but rising again from the grave. It probably has something to do with that is why Jesus said he's the only way to God. Someone might say, well, why is God so narrow-minded that he only gave one way to be saved? Um, Have you ever been upset when you go to Chipotle and they're out of your favorite meat? (laughs) There's this place, like a Chipotle place in in Dallas where we like to go called Chilosos. We go there every time we're in town visiting the kids. And I like to get their brisket salad. And I go there with the kids and the grandson and everything this week. And I'm like, I'll have their brisket salad. And they said, we're out of brisket today. And I am praying imprecatory psalms over the establishment. (laughs) And so I get the much less tasty barbacoa. Now, I'm sitting there, and I think the Lord's saying, you know, Cliff, you ought to be grateful that you're eating something. (laughs) That there's like six other options. Why fuss in your soul about the one you wanted? And I think that's the way. We ought to be grateful that God provided any way for us to be saved. Because I'm looking at you guys this morning. None of y'all deserve to be saved. (laughs) I would say the same for myself. We We should be full of gratitude and full of hallelujahs nonstop that he provided any way to be saved. And we should be burdened for those who don't know this truth. The fifth principle this morning is lovingly insist on the uniqueness of the gospel. 